Anybody talking at the back? Uh, <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Dundee Literary Festival. Uh, my name is uh, Russell McLean, and um, I'm a crime writer whose work has been based in and around the Dundee area. But um, I mentioned that, I usually wouldn't mention entirely much about who I am, but the reason I do is that today's guest is someone without whom I probably wouldn't be writing the kind of books that I do, and certainly a lot of us um, who are in the Scottish crime industry wouldn't be writing them. He wrote three um, classic novels that, um, or they became classic novels that uh, essentially changed the rules for Scottish crime writer. More than that, he's a man who lives and breathes writing. His career has been varied, illuminating, and never less than fascinating. He's the winner of two Crime Writers Association daggers, a Whitbread Award, and that's back before it became the Costa, um, when it was uh, less commercial, and a BAFTA. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the absolutely brilliant William McIlvanny. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. I feel very welcome after yeah. that. <laughs> I, I'm glad I scrapped the other one where I said he writes terrible fiction. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's been an eventful couple of years for you, um, or certainly the last year in, in particular, I think with the republication, which as the, anyone who's seen the programs will know of Laidlaw and the, the other two books, um, with a whole new generation of people discovering, in some cases rediscovering the novels. And I remember the frustration as a bookseller of having them constantly out of print. But what, what sparked the, the reprint of, of Laidlaw? How well, did I mean, this re-begin for you? Suppose, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. I never know these things, you know. I suppose that um, it began for me when a man phoned me about a year and a half ago and said, I would like to republish The Big Man. Uh, what's the story? And I said, I, I don't know what the story is. I don't know whether it's in print or out of print. He said, well, I'll write to the publisher. And he wrote a letter. And three months later, I got a letter from my own publisher saying, I've just received a letter. Three months. I've <laughs> just received a letter uh, asking about the big man. And I'm sorry it took so long to get to my desk. And I knew right away there's something wrong there. And I wrote back to Carol, lovely lady, and I said, Carol, where do you work? The court of Kafka's Chinese emperor. <laughs> it takes three months for a letter to get to your desk. I said, you know, grandly, I want my, my books back. Nobody was buying them anyway, so, so <laughs> I, I want my books back. And uh, strangely enough, they agreed, because I still owed them from the previous advance. And then I had the books, and I thought, well, that's good, but what do I do with them now, you know? I can say I own my own books, but nobody reads them. <laughs> but Jenny Brown, blessedly, came through to Glasgow and met me and said, I want to be your agent. And I said, well, there's nothing to agent, but if you wish to be my agent. And she did, and she went to Canongate, and the rest, as they say, is history. It was just an amazing transformation in my life, because I thought I was dead in the water. Well, I was dead in the water. And because Canongate, through Jenny, took on the books, there was a kind of resurrection, you know. Has it made you feel kind of revitalized as a writer in your own, your own work to have this attention coming back? In a sense it has, except that what has happened with the re-emergence of the books is that I've been doing readings for the last nine months. And I begin to feel like William Michael Vanney posing as a writer. Because <laughs> I haven't written anything for ages, and I, I really want to get back to just staring at the page. So much as I love it, and I'm not being ungrateful, it's been a terrific experience. It has removed me from writing anything else, because I'm, I'm very strange. I have to sit and brood and develop utter conviction in what I'm doing, and then I can write. And at the moment, I can't get near the page, yeah. You can't, yeah, there's no, I mean. But I've made a few quid, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> listen, you've got to look at the upside. You Absolutely. Know, yeah. Absolutely. We're going to see Laidlaw book a year suddenly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the Laidlaw and um, papers of Tony Veitch and Strange Loyalties Veitch. are. Veitch. Tony oh. Veitch. The Americans <laughs> yeah. say Tony Veitch. Veitch. Ah, yes, Tony Veitch. I've been spending too, many time, too much time with the Americans. Um, but, I mean, they're regarded as the books that kind of invented modern Scottish crime fiction, or that's how people have come to see them. 
But I know that when you wrote them, you said that you read very little crime fiction at that time. So why did you come to write a crime novel with Laidlaw? Well, I mean, uh, the only crime fiction, I mean, I, and I, I'm sure Agatha Christie's a wonderful person and made a fortune. I wouldn't be cheeky to her. But I couldn't go at, you know, when I read Murder at the Vicarage, I thought, oh no, I'm missing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I cannot join you in the vicarage here. <laughs> and the, but I did actually, it's funny you mention it, I did read Chandler and I thought it was almost kind of poetic crime writing. Mm -hmm. And I, I suppose that made me think there are more things you can do with crime writing than up to that point was being done. And uh, Gore Vidal said a terrific thing once. He said, any writer, we must colonize the genre. In other words, go where the readers are and do your best, but meet the readers. Don't sit in your ivory tower saying, I'm writing an amazing novel that nobody will ever read. Go out there and scuffle for readers. And I, I decided I wanted to do that by a kind of roundabout route. I've, I'd written a book called Doherty, which is about the first quarter of the 20th century. And I was kind of hungry to connect, because I spoke to ex-miners and beautiful elderly ladies who'd lived through it and tried to amass a sense of what it must have been like. And much as I loved it, I was starving for contemporary life. I was out of touch. And I, you know, this sounds terrible. I heard the voice. Sounds like Joan of Arc. <laughs> I heard the voice. And it was an abrasive voice and it was saying pretty hard things. And I knew, I knew it was a man because no woman I've ever known spoke like this. But, so I thought he's a man, and I thought, he's going to a lot of bad places, so he's got to be a detective. And I thought he's got to be a Glasgow detective, because I'm a convert to Glasgow. I'm from Kilmarnock, an amazing 20 miles from Glasgow. <laughs> in fact, when I wrote the first laid law, they really, in the papers, a lot of people took me to task, coming here with his big Kilmarnock bonnet. <laughs> <laughs> and telling us about Glasgow, I thought, Christ, it's 20 miles away. <laughs> I can get a bus. <laughs> but, I mean, so that's what I wanted to do, because I, I love Glasgow. And I, I said to some of those journalists who'd said that, I said, listen, converts to a faith are frequently more intense in the faith than those born into it. I said, I'm a convert to Glasgow, and I love the place. So I wanted to write about Glasgow, and it was going to be, a, and it was through all of these circuitous routes that I decided it's got to be a detective story. That was all. That was so that was, uh, It wasn't that I will now write a detective story. I, I want to write this book. And eventually I thought it has to be a detective story. Mm -hmm. And I was unintimidated by the fact that it was a detective story. Yeah. I thought, because I've read some good detective stories. Because mm -hmm. I was going to ask, did you think that your lack, well, not your lack of knowledge, but your, your you didn't have as much experience with the genre. Do you think that was maybe an advantage? To oh, absolutely. Sense? It was mm -hmm. like, I don't know the rules here, so I'm no, I'm no inhibited by them. You know, if you, if you don't know the rules of the game that they're playing, you can introduce some interesting aberrations to it. And I like that. I thought, I, I, there's a lot of folk read crime fiction. I want to write my kind of crime fiction, and if it falls in its arse, fair enough, but that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And it obviously didn't fall in its arse because you did come back. <laughs> no. Because there's a gap between the, the books, though. I mean, now we're used to crime novels coming out one book every year, you know, and all the rest of it. But there's a gap between the papers of Tony Veach and Laidlaw, of course. You've, That's a you've noticed five. that. Yep. You've noticed that. Yeah, and the, then it was a massive one between uh, that and Strange Loyalties. And I might write another Laidlaw, and that'll be an even yeah. more massive one. It'll yeah. be like 20 mm, years yeah. or so. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> I've... When Laidlaw came out, the publisher said, if you write one a year, you'll be a millionaire. <laughs> but I'm a man of purity of purpose. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I thought, I can't do it. I just, I can't do that. I mean, it was a lovely idea, but I, I thought, I can't do that. It's not how it works. I, it, um, I write from compulsion, and I have to earn the compulsion every time I stop a boot. I have to earn the compulsion for the next one. And I just know, I knew, I thought, I can't do this. And um, as I've said before, sometimes at two in the morning, I wake up and think, oh, why did you not at least try harder <laughs> to, do, to do one a year? But no, I'm, 
I just, no, it wouldn't have worked for me. Mm -hmm. Not what I do. But I mean, so what was it that brought you back to Laidlaw then? If, you know, the first one comes out, you've got these other ideas, but then he obviously, the papers of Tony Vici well, comes the, back. Mm -hmm. It was, I don't know, it was that I loved the character, and I'm not saying anybody else should, but I loved him. I thought he's a hard person to deal with, but he's got real principles, and he believes in the job he's trying to do. And I, I suppose he just kind of haunted me about that. I mean, the, I did try. I mean, the, the, the book after Laid Law is another crime novel. Mm -hmm. It's got four years between, and it shows you me trying to wrestle with this principle of doing one a year. And I suppose the papers of Tony Veach taught me that I'm never going to do a book a year. I mean, I couldn't write the dandy comic a year. It's just, <laughs> it's just not what I do. And I, I kind of, it, it was me confronting what the publisher told me and doing my best. And four years is a lot longer than a year, I know, but I did my best and I thought, no, I can't do that. It's just, although I knew I couldn't, I thought, well, I'll try it because it's a lovely offer. But, and that's when I thought, no, I can't do it. I've got to write, there are other things that seize me that I really want to write. And uh, I think I'm right, or did I write The Big Man? The, I'm I'm sure mean, only, it shows you how good yeah. I am <laughs> judging I should have my brought the technology with me. I think, I think right. maybe I wrote The Big Man next, mm. didn't I? Because I, I went been, to yeah. Paris, I know that, and I lived in Paris. And that's one of the lucky things that happened. You don't become a millionaire if you don't write one a year. But I was in London, and a fella phoned up, knew he was there, and spoke to him. He was a French journalist, and he loved Laidlaw. He just loved it. And he said, what are you doing next? And I said, well, I'm trying to write another book. But I said, I need isolation to do it. I'm struggling. He said, well, I'll give you a flat in Paris free for a year. And I thought, well, that's <laughs> what I was expecting, really. I thought nobody would ever say that. And it was amazing. It just, he said, because I'm in, in dispute with my landlord and nothing needs to be paid till that's settled, and it'll take a year at least, it's going to court. And I'm living with my lady now that I've just met since all this dispute happened. So there's a flat in Boulevard Osman, free, for a year, and I thought, well, I think I'll think about that. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, it just these lovely things that happen in life. That, and so I, I spent a year there, and I, I think it was the big man. I, it was the big man trying to write that, and I finished it when I came back. And just that, I mean, the thing that's dictated my life is stunning good fortune. Like, and the people you meet, like and the reception you get for books because I wrote the first book Remedy is none I was terrified at my wits nobody in my family had ever done anything like this they were all decent honest people <laughs> <laughs> they hadn't written a bloody book and I, I honestly was terrified and I got when the, the reviews came out two reviews one in the Times and one in the Observer made me think hey Maybe I can do this. And it's, it's small things like that. One guy said, Irving Wardle, because you remember the names of your benefactors, he wrote for the Observer and he said he creates characters so strong that you feel you might not put on much of a show in their company. And I thought, aha, uh -huh, that'll do me. <laughs> and there was Freddie Raphael, who was a novelist, who said, full of joy in writing and alert to the anguish of life. I carried those two quotes in my head while I was trying to write the next book, like the iron rations of self-belief. Because I thought, two folk believe in me, a lot. <laughs> and I think it comes, life comes down to these wee things, the, the things that feed the necessity of what you have to do. And those two reviews made me a writer, I think, because mm -hmm. I was terrified. You write a book and you think, I don't know what I've done. I might embarrass the whole family, you know. <laughs> and the confidence those two reviews gave me was stunning. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you had these two fantastic reviews, obviously, but how, how did it feel? I mean, do you read your own reviews? Do you, how do you react to the negative ones that perhaps come back sometimes, if, if there are any? I, haven't, I, I, haven't I don't remember any. a negative review, yeah. darling. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean... Yeah, I mean, you think things like you're a wanker. <laughs> 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 
but uh, now I've just been really lucky because I've always, and, and comprehensively, had good reviews from the beginning. And there were, there have been some, but I suppose to me it's a very simple equation. If the, the good reviews outweigh the bad ones, you're home alone. Mm -hmm. And I needed it. I definitely had huge lack of confidence when I published the first book. Especially, I mean, Remedy is none. <clears throat> I was still teaching in Irvine Royal. There's a lovely guy in principal in the English department, Richie Bell, and they'd heard this, you know. Wally has wrote a book. This guy that's went round the school. And uh, I remember Richie in the staff room said to me, because that wasn't the original title. He said, So what what's your book called, Wally? I said, Well, it's called Thunder in the Dark. So I don't have a fancy that, Wally. It seems to me like a fart in a bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your support, you know. <laughs> And, it's, and I, it's that very Scottish thing that, you know, mm. even before you get carried away, we're sold to bring you down anyway. <laughs> Your first editorial input there. No, um, that's right. <laughs> um, to, to bring it slightly back with the, the, the Laidlaw thing and the final one, Strange Loyalties, what really fascinated me with it, because you've mentioned already Raymond Chandler, and I'm a big fan of his as well, and that you suddenly switch from this third person narrative, which is quite mm -hmm. Hamlet esque, I would say to this intensely personal first person. Yeah. Which, why did you go, what, what, was it the nature of the story that did this to you, or was it a conscious? I think it was. I mean, it's very difficult to be honest and say absolutely why it happened. I just knew that somehow it had to be first person this time. I think there were various things. Like you say, the nature of the story, which is a kind of examine, it's in a, it's, because I've always wanted to try and keep twisting twisting and doing something different. And this is really a detective examining his own life. I mean, that's the, the core of the book. And I thought, I love that idea. It's a fascinating idea. A guy who's got this kind of forensic head, turning it upon himself and trying to work out the sort of meaning of his own life. And it was, it was partly that, I suppose. And partly also that first person you know, if you're writing third person, the, the kind of flourish you can give to the prose, you can give that, but the flourish you can give to the dialogue, you can't, but you've got to watch, the, it's got to be realistic speech. And I just wanted to meld those two together and have such freedom. Mm -hmm. So if it's Laidlaw's head, he's, he's, he's quite a smart ass anyway, so if he's saying smart things in his head, you believe it, because that's what he's like. And I, it was that, it was a, a desire to combine the elements that I had in the other books. And for me, maybe it didn't work, but for me, kind of put them into overdrive. Let's see where this can go if you can get a detective novel where the guy's bright and he's telling the story. And I just wanted to try that. Because mm -hmm. he does seem more acerbic suddenly when he comes into the first, oh, first right, version, right. very. But there's a deeper He always was a Serbian, right yeah. enough, but it does seem even more <laughs> I mean, so. even more so, you uh, know, which is a terrifying thought. Um, so, I mean, b before we continue, I mean, we, we've talked about him as a bit of a character and stuff like that, and I, I wonder if there's a little bit from the, the book that you could... You well, could I am in a... Mm -hmm. Here's one I made earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think we planned this, folks? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is... Uh, I never know which parts to read because I suppose they all have a kind of personal resonance for me. But this is Laidlaw, Early Doors in the first book. There's been a girl called Jennifer Lawson found dead in Kelvin Grove Park. And they discover that the last place that they know she went to was a disco in Glasgow called Poppy's Disco. And so Laidlaw and Hartness, his sidekick, they said, we better go there. So this is, I suppose, a kind of, it's about the first time we were aware of Laidlaw's technique. So this is Laidlaw going into Poppy's disco and asking a few questions. Poppy's was in a court behind Buchanan Street, along with a couple of abstruse businesses. 
and an anonymous second-hand bookshop. It was the most recent example in Glasgow of a pub with adjoining disco, recent enough for Harkness, who was a young man, not to know it. He knew the Griffin and Joanna's in Bath Street, Waves and Spankies at Custom House Quay. The pub here, the Maverick, was closed just now, but the door to Poppy's was open. As they climbed the stone stairs to the landing, they heard a droning noise. The double doors closed behind them in green bays. The motif was gambling. There were cushioned dice along the walls for sitting on. Each wall light held a poker hand and glass. The floor of the small stage for the go-go dancers was a mosaic of a roulette wheel. At the end of the room, the bar counter was an enormous upended domino double six. Love would appear to be a lottery, Laidlaw said. The noise was coming from a hoover. The woman who worked it had her back to them. Context gave her an unconscious poignancy. She was elderly and fat. Each bare leg was a complex of varicose veins from too many children. Just by being here, she was commenting ironically on all this jumped up sophistication. Laidlaw crossed and touched her shoulder. She was halfway to the ceiling before she realized what was happening. The kicked hoover gave out gradually like a mechanical heart attack. Oh my God, son, she said. You should tell my next of kin before you do that. <laughs> Behind the feminine flummox, she was smiling already, her face as welcoming as an open fire. I'm sorry, Laidlaw said. We're looking for Mr. Rayburn. Ah, he's in. He'll be up in his office lately. Oh dear, that's the most exciting thing that's happened to me since I fell out of the shawl. They went up the few carpeted stairs to the bar area. There was a corridor on the left. Behind the third door they knocked at, a voice shouted, Hello there. Laidlaw opened the door. The room was well carpeted, curtained, nicely furnished. Opposite them, behind a desk, a young man was sitting in a swivel chair. He was sallow-faced, and his lank hair had more grease than a chip pan. A big, a big black leather jacket sat on his body like a suit of armor. His calf-length boots rested on top of the desk. He was cleaning his fingernails with an ornamental knife. Ah, it's a game. We'd like to see Mr. Rayburn, Laidlaw said. You got an appointment? What is he, Laidlaw said, a dentist? The young man was concentrating on looking very tough. Put your sneer away, Laidlaw said. It's getting faded. Keep it for a good thing. The young man swung his feet onto the floor, stood up without haste, letting what he imagined was the tension build. He came out from behind the desk, knife vaguely drooping. Laidlaw flashed his police card. How's that for a counterpunch, he said. Son, you are about to lose in two ways. If you don't stop playing at Jack the Ripper's, I'll take that paper knife off you and shove it up your rectum. Then I'll arrest you in an ambulance. Tell him to come out of his hidey hole. The young man put the knife on the desk. I'm supposed to check in people for Harry. He was like a boy complaining that the game isn't being played according to the rules. You can get some weirdies in here. I can see that, Laidlaw said. Harry, it's the police. The door across the room opened and Harry Rayburn emerged. He would be in his 40s, big and tired looking, the black curling hair long and decoratively streaked with grey. He wore a shirt like an action painting, sleeves rolled up to show impressive hairy forearms. Melted down, the silver buckle of his belt could have saved the economy. <laughs> Mr. Rayburn, Laidlaw showed him his card. I'm Detective Inspector Laidlaw, Crime Squad. This is Detective Constable Hartness. We're investigating a murder. Rayburn nodded. What's the connection with us? Well, it's a girl called Jennifer Lawson from Jim Chapel. She was murdered on Saturday night. We believe she came dancing here that night. If she did, it's odds on she met the man here. It's her money we take. Know their 40s, eh, Harry? 
Little Hill looked at the young man as if he was a headache. Harry Rayburn looked impressively annoyed. Can it, Lenny? Alas, he's dead. Then to Laidlaw, is there any way you think we can help? This is the girl Laidlaw passed him the photograph. It's a million to one chance, but we have to take it. Harry Rayburn shook his head. I'm oh, sorry, but these young girls all look as if they came off the same assembly line to me. See one, you've seen them all. Laidlaw passed the photograph to Lenny, who glanced at it and laid it on the desk. How many evening staff do you employ, employ in here? It's a variable. In general, say, three behind the bar. He seemed to find it difficult to work it out. A couple of go-go dancers, when we're having that, they spell each other. Two in the door, maybe two other stewards. Lenny shook with, laugh, with voiceless laughter and whispered, stewards, to himself, shaking his head. Can you give me a list? That seemed to be a problem. Uh, not offhand. Some of the boys are just doing it for a bit extra. Casual light, you know? It'll take me time. The bloke who handles all that isn't in. You're not the manager. You own the place. Harry Rayburn smiled. Every crack in the ceiling's paid for. I started with the Maverick years ago and now this place. All right, Laidlaw said. Thanks for your help. I'm afraid you'll be getting more visitors. They can collect the information. He picked up the photograph. You don't know her, Hartness asked. No, Lenny said. Fanciable. Too late knew though, isn't it? And, with, and what about this vibrantly sensitive young man, Laidlaw said. What does he do for you, Mr. Rayburn? Here, now you can definitely hear the Chandler with the, the one-liners there, I think. Um, I mean, did you realize at the time that you were writing these books, or even later, I, I suppose it's later, did you realize later how much you'd influenced other writers by, by doing these, or how much influence you'd had in the No, world? not a clue, not a clue. But I mean, uh, last year for the first time, well, it was the first Bloody Scotland, which is a, you know, Scottish crime fiction jamboree, which was great. And um, I was invited there, and there is, the respect I got from other writers, most of whom have made a lot more money than I have, by the way. <laughs> but it was terrific. They really, I had no idea that I had had that effect on people. I mean, full of Val McDermott, the lovely Val said, uh, you made me want to be a crime writer. And I had no idea of that. It was a terrific kind of happy surprise for me to go there. So no, I did it for myself. And I had no expectation of anything. It just that I felt this is the book I want to write, so I'm going to write it. So the aftermath has been like, as I said once, like a pension. And I'm well into pensions these days. Like a pension that I never knew I was going to get, a pension of esteem. So it was great. So and I, I found, what I found about, sorry, what I found about that was that I've been to a lot of literary things, you know, where people are walking about with big knives sticking out their back, they don't know where they are, you know? Because some folk put the knife in when you're nowhere there. You know? And uh, this was the opposite. It was just so benign and mutually generous. It was great. So you don't mind being associated very closely with a particular genre then? Not at all, not at all. Because, I mean, I, I don't have any embarrassment about writing crime. At the same time, I don't think I'm defined by writing crime, because I wrote it. I mean, out of, what, nine novels, three are crime novels? No. No, I'm no. It doesn't bother me in the least. And it's, it's actually, as I say, quite nice to get people say that you help to inspire them to do what they're doing. I mean, I think with the, the novels themselves and with certainly other ones, there's um, a sense of being on the streets, being in, in real places. There's that. And part of your, your work is associated with the kind of working class life. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you've, you've said of your ambitions, there's an interview with Len Vanner that I found that said, um, your ambitions are not to glorify working class life, but to show that it doesn't need glorifying. Absolutely. Do you think that by using a genre, you're, you're achieving some of that, perhaps? I would think so. I mean, I think uh, it seems to me an integral part of what I've been trying to do all my life. I think I've, you never know how you started to write or why it happened. But I know 
When I was a kid, I came from a very talkative family. I think a lot of us did in working class life. But I loved it. It was, it was like, you know, cousins come in with their first girlfriend. I mean, my mother far would be, it was a council house, a wee living room. And uncles come in for the pub to tell stories of their mining days and things. And it was just astonishing. It was like, you know, I used to sit be about eight or nine when all this, I was started taking all this in. I thought, this is actually amazing. I didn't think, uh, well, I remember a young man, I used to show you what it was like. I, I used to love that and we stayed up quite late. And I remember a, a young guy in command that wanted me to join the YMCA, which I was not averse to because they had table tennis and all that. You know? And uh, he came to the door one night at about 11 o'clock, and I was third year at uh, Kilmarnock Academy. And he said, the first thing he said was, I'm shocked that you're out of bed at this time of night. I thought, well, why the hell did you come to the house? Then? <laughs> <laughs> so it was this kind of point, I'm really shocked. <laughs> and I thought, and I, I remember thinking, not at that moment, but I thought back in afterwards, and I thought, shocked. I would have given thousands to be where I was rather than and no harm to the YMCA. Because <laughs> I was hearing things in there that were just magical. Just endless stories. It was like a buy a tapestry of stories. And I think that's where I started wanting to write. I thought, I mean, I remember, it. God, you, I could be a pretentious young man. I can still be, I suppose, a pretentious old man. But I remember a, a mate of mine at uni was saying to me, I'd be, be about 19. And he said, and the new folk knew, I mean, it gets out the kind of shame that you're trying to write, you know. It gets around. And he said, uh, what is it you think you want to try to do your writing, Molly? And I said, a terrible idea. It's so embarrassing. How pompous. I said, I want to give a voice, give a voice, <laughs> to folk whose histories are parish registers and they never heard of anywhere else. I'm so embarrassed I said it, but it's true. Because <laughs> that was what it's, I wanted to say. These lives are so amazing. And there is, you know, as important as courtiers or anybody. And so Laidlaw is the same thing. You know, it's in, you know, like, if you love a city like Glasgow, find a way into it. Find a way to examine it. And the detective story did that for me. I find it interesting you were saying about the reactions people had to you writing because uh, there's a there's a really nice thing I found in an interview you did with uh, another crime writer Tony Black um, where you talked about growing up in your house and I think that you said <coughs> oh, poetry readings but would draw the curtains in case people threw stones at you. Aye, we used to have poetry readings. We didn't. I remember, <coughs> and this is how potent the background that came from was. I remember about seventeen coming in from the dancing. Having seen another unfortunate girl home, and uh, my mother sitting at the fire, at the fire end with the the canary, where the canary used to just sit in her lap, kind of just kind of <laughs> go to sleep there. And she's got the housework done, and she's reading the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. And I remember thinking, maybe every Husin scheme. And every who's and every who's and scheme folk are not doing this. And I thought, I think she was the key. My father, I loved my father, but I don't know my father had a book in his puff. But my mother read all her life. And so there were books in the house. Then I was the youngest of four. So there were always folk reading books in the house. And that was, that was terrific. I mean, my mother, how's this for a strange prezi? She was a very bright wee lassie who got special dispensation to leave school at 12 to go to work in a mill. I mean, that's a favour to give a wee lass, you know. And uh, that always haunted me, that, that she, she continued reading in spite of it. She just carried on. And uh, I mean, I think, she, I think working class women were the key to working class family life. The men always had a few doolally ideas in their head and all that, and were less de dependable. But the, the kernel, of what in class life was just terrific women. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've, you mentioned there about continuing reading despite you know getting the dispensation to go to the mill and things like uh, that, as, as though it's a compulsion. 
And it kind of strikes me as well that with, with writers as well as readers, there's that, do, do you feel that compulsion with words yourself is carried on through? Somehow Sorry, how do you mean? The, the compulsion to read is the same, would be the same as the compulsion to write. Oh, I mean, I mm. think that, I mean, uh, very quickly, the transition from reading to writing happened for me. At, when I was 14, I wrote what I jocularly call my first poem. I was sitting in the living room and I wrote this, and I remember my father saying to me, what are you doing, son? <laughs> what are you up to, son? I said, I'm writing a poem. I said, yeah. I was always a confident boy. I'm writing a poem. And he said, uh, oh, I fine. But I was very careful. I chose who I showed it to. It was a weird thing. I thought, I think it's a poem. It was like a bit of extraterrestrial material had fallen in the living room table. I thought, I think I have went and wrote a poem. <laughs> and I, my big brother Neely was very kind to my pretensions. He was at the back door. I always remember sawing a, a piece of wood. And I chose him. Because I think if I'd said to Hugh, I went, oh, what a load of shit. <laughs> so I went out to Neely and I gave him it. He said, you didn't write that, kid. I said, I did. He said, I think that's terrific. And that was me. You know, Ofsky. I've often thought every book should have at the front nearly to blame. Because <laughs> if he had said that's crap, that might have been it over, you know. When you get back to writing the next one, you can maybe put that at the front mm. <laughs> when, when, it, when it comes out. Um, I mean, this is, I've, I've got a million one questions I could ask you, but of course, there, there are people here who are far more intelligent than I am. Um, and than and I am. More so beautiful, good. I think, than, than either of us, possibly, um, out here. Um, but um, so if anybody does have any questions, um, because he's an immensely approachable uh, man, as you can already tell, please do raise your hand. And um, there will be a roving mic coming around so we can hear your, your dulcet tones. Don't let that put you off. <laughs> If anybody does at all, or you're just going to get me again. It's nice just ah, sitting I here. I can isn't see, it? yeah. We can just stare at them until somebody raises. We've got one here. Um, <laughs> people often ask writers like yourself, um, you know, if you're authentic as far as police officers are concerned or as far as lawyers are concerned. What about the criminal fraternity who have become very famous through all this uh, crime literature? Have you ever had any feedback from the criminal fraternity or called on that about how they respond to this uh, depiction uh, of themselves? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think I've had feedback specific to my books, but in the process of researching the books, I made contact with a, a few people who, shall we say, are on the kind of shady side of the law. <laughs> and. Uh, I've never had any, but, but nobody's ever said to me, that's terrible what you wrote. And, but I can think of one who has mentioned the books and who did quite like them, but the rest, it was just in the background. I mean, not that I've known that many, but I've known quite a few in Glasgow, because Glasgow is such an open city. You can go into places and you, and you can find yourself chatting with people you never thought, both from a kind of important area of society or from a criminal one. So all I can say is, no, they've never, maybe they've been kind. Nobody's ever said, you know, I've had policemen say you got it right. But I've never had criminals saying you got it right. <laughs> Possibly. Maybe because, because I didn't, but, or maybe because they don't want to go near that area at all. But I've, I've had quite generous responses from some policemen, but I mean, I can think of two, of, shall we say, I hate to say that about them, of the criminal fraternity, probably. But I mean, I got on very well with them, but always in that neutral way. We, we don't talk, I don't say, well, what have you been up to this week? <laughs> <laughs> I try not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I find it perfectly relaxed. But no, I, I've never had anybody say any of the criminal, I've had policemen saying, yeah, I think you got that right there, and, but never the other, because they're, I suppose if they told me they got it right, that would be a bad thing to say. <laughs> you got any? I can see your hand, I think. And then. Hi, I was just wondering uh, what your, uh, if there was any one particular person uh, who 
inspired the character of Vladar? It's a good question. And I'm not telling you the answer. No. <laughs> Why are they no, still I mean, alive? <laughs> no, I, no, there's, uh, no, there isn't. There's, there are policemen I knew who were very helpful and took me around places. And, mm -hmm. But no, there wasn't anybody. The, the best thing I ever heard about Laidla was a guy who was quite senior in the police after the first one came out because I got a lot of stick as well as praise for that book. And he said, I wish I had 20 like him in the force. So I've had compliments about Laidlaw, but I've never, no, I've never had any, it's, it's almost very discreet with the police, I've found. They will tell you things in the QT, but not among, not among a group. So no, I've had no, Nobody told me how to make Laidlaw. I made Laidlaw first, and then I made him a policeman. And it was take it or leave it at the time. On a, a lighter note, Willie, I had the good fortune of uh, visiting Wembley with you in the early 1980s. <laughs> and I remember on that trip, I met two of your Glasgow detective pals, and they told me a story about getting lost in London on the way back to the, your brother Huey's house. Would you like to share that story with oh, That audience? was lovely. I, that <laughs> <laughs> we used to go down to London, you know, in the, every two years to the Wembley thing, and uh, there was a guy, Robbie, and there was a guy, Jack McLeish, Sadly, Jack's gone now, but it was, it was some item. And they were both Ayrshire men, but working in Glasgow. And we used to go down every, every second year, and we would get a bit obstreperous occasionally. And, and quite often, we, it was one time that we all split up, you know, we're all seeking our own purposes. God knows what they may have been. But, and my brother Huey, who worked with a the Times, works with the Times, I think he was maybe with the Observer at that time. But he had a house in Richmond. And you know that thing you do when you're going to, well, that's what we did anyway. You just find somebody that's got a house and pile in there, you know. <laughs> no, no need to be, pay for a hotel. So we're all staying at Huey's house. And uh, after the game, I think we won that time. And we, we kind of scattered. And Huey lives in Richmond which is key to the story. And he, he lived in a, a flat in Richmond at that time. And in any case, we all eventually come back to Huey's house and have a few libations. And Jack is missing. And when he turns up, he's delivered in a police car. <laughs> and we think, what? So we say, well, there, that's a police car he's in, you know. When he comes in, we say, what happened? He said, we all split up. He said, I'm, I was in Richmond. He said, I've got the darn scarf and all that, and I'm sitting in a dike. So I sat down and I was kind of tired. I sat down and all that. He said, this police van suddenly screamed to a halt and they jumped out, you know, it was like, you know, Z cars or something. <laughs> and he said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm sitting in a wall. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, but why this wall? He said, it's a wall, didn't he say, there is a wall, I will know. <laughs> he said, it's just a wall. He said, this is the home of David Attenborough. <laughs> and Jack said, quick as a flash, he went, oh, well, he said, somebody called me an animal and I came for a second of <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And the police drove him home, because he was a policeman. He showed them the car, drove him home. But I love that. Somebody called me an animal that came for a second opinion. Um, I think, oh dear, how can we It's a good that? one, Billy, isn't it? It's a cracker. I'm not sure there w there's a way we can easily top that, but I do believe mm. before we go, you do have one last treat for the, the audience. I don't know if we've if yeah. got the time, I. Got, yeah. This is just a... a, a I'll kind of introduce it, just a wee bit of reading it. Because my nephew, Neil, very kindly constructed a website for me. Because I am more or less computer illiterate. 
And it was that one, the other thing that happens after a funeral, we got retired to the pub and sitting talking, and I said, I wouldn't mind having a website. And he said, I'll make you one. And that was it, you know, it's as simple as that. Say the right thing at the right time. And it's, because something, the thing I'm going to read, something happened when they republished the books. I did an audio book of Laidlaw. Be careful you don't stumble across it. <laughs> but it, it's the only time in my life I've read the, the book sentence by sentence. Because the rest, you just kind of skim read and say, I remember that. But, but, and I realized the changes since Laidlaw are astonishing. Laidlaw was published in 77. The changes are utterly astonishing. Like Laidlaw and Hart is going to bust and there's a conductor there. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> You're not going to get conductors now. You know, if they want to make a phone call, they have to get into a phone box. No, it's mobile phones. You know, the internet. So the, the changes are phenomenal in the last 30 or so years. And it also struck me, which is what this piece is about, the changes are phenomenal in attitude as well. I mean, I came from a working class background where my father was an ex miner and he just loved animals. Our house had, we had always cats, we had dogs, we had canaries and budgies and everything. And, but my awareness of animals was that they are animals, you know. Don't start putting wee funny hats on them or anything like that. You know. <laughs> and, uh, and to, to illustrate it, my father's talent, we, I think a lot of miners said that. He'd been at the dogs and he'd lost his whack. He hadn't been picked the winner. And uh, we had a canary, Joey, the one that was sitting in my mother's lap. It had the run in the living room. It just flew about and it's a terrific wee bird. I, I remember when I was about seven, eight, combing your hair, it always landed in the comb. You'd go, no, no, go, no I'm, I'm on the comb. <laughs> it's my comb. Can this? daft wee bird. And so my father and I got the run of the house. My father comes home and lost his money at the dogs and he's really depressed. Oh, what a time I've had in the He said, I'm afraid that's not the worst of it. He said, what? Joey's escaped. Because <laughs> what they got around the living in these, in our, those council houses, there was a wee middle window that you could just to let air in. Somebody had done that and Joey was out. And that was that. Imagine Joey has escaped. And my father said, oh my God, no. Yeah. I can take the loss at the dogs, but Joey has escaped. He said, how did that happen? So somebody just left a wee bit of the window. And we've gone, oh, it's really sad. And my father took the cage off the stand, opened the door and left a packet of bird seed. And we thought, no, this cannot be happening. He's going to go out of the house <laughs> in a housing scheme and try and get the bird back. I said, don't, no, don't do it, Daddy, don't do it. He went out, and he's walking down the middle of the road, shaking the bird seeds, shouting, Joey, Joey. I mean, you could get arrested for that. Joey, 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 shaking him. It flew, this is true, flew onto his head, and he hit it into the cage. <laughs> and the wings are all behind him. It's like St. Francis of Assisi. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Joey has been recovered. That's true. He's got the bloody... Canary bats. So this is saying that our, our attitude to animals at that time was slightly different from now. This is called zoistry. And what zoistry means, the dictionary has two meanings, two cognate meanings. The worship of animals as the incarnation of certain deities or extreme or excessive devotion to animals, particularly household pets. And I promise you, I mean this, every word of this is true. It may seem far-fetched, it's true. I once visited a man, once was enough, who lived with a Doberman that was a terrible bully. The man was nice, but he seemed to think that his dog was the householder. So did the dog. I'll call it Snarl to protect its identity, <laughs> although I don't see why I should. Snarl seemed to control more or less everything that happened in the house. It padded about among the conversation as if it were working for the thought police, staring disconcertingly at anyone who was talking. I suspected that it was terrifically stupid, 
But I didn't mention that, just in case it wasn't as dumb as I thought and caught my gist. Two words it definitely did understand were cheerio and goodbye. People who carelessly mentioned one of these words would be immediately pinned to their chair or against a wall if they were standing while Snarl growled ominously at them and showed a set of upper teeth which wouldn't have looked out of place in an alligator's mouth. I think it was trying to express in canine language something like, so you don't like my company, eh? <laughs> People who wanted to, to leave, which I would think was pretty well everybody, would have to work out their own discrete formula for getting out. I have a certain predilection for departure, someone might say. Or, ah, well, parting is such sweet sorrow. That way, Snarl didn't know what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> they could drift casually towards the hall, still talking, and then make a sudden break for the outside door. <laughs> Feeling a need to visit the lavatory, I asked my host where it was. He explained and then added in a very quiet voice, don't shut the door of the toilet. Snarl hates closed doors. I explained to him in an equally quiet voice, that Snarl would just have to cope, since, <laughs> since I didn't intend to expose such tackle as I had to the dental whims of a megalomaniac Doberman. <clears throat> I was relieved to relieve myself without the repeated sound of a heavy body thudding against the bathroom door. I don't go to the pub anymore, the man said in my return. Snarl doesn't like it. That was my cue to talk of tactical withdrawals and visitations which must be over all too soon. Snarl knew I was saying something, but he'd be damned if he knew what it was. I left, wondering why the man didn't just buy Snarl a twin set in pearls and marry it. <laughs> <laughs> the memory of this came unbidden into my mind when I read recently in the papers that beaches for dogs are one of the latest crazies. I realized how that far off occasion had been the harbinger of a progressive tendency in our society, treating dogs as people. Read my snarling lips. Dogs are not people. Animals are animals. Yet these days we have canine psychiatrists. I have my misgivings about the effectiveness of human psychiatry. <laughs> But at least the clients can tell you whether they feel the better for it or not. <laughs> How are you supposed to tell if a neurotic dog feels it has benefited from its treatment? Does it bite you more gently? <laughs> or bark in a saner key? And now, beaches for dogs. I'm all for dogs enjoying themselves. But are we sure that's what they will do on a sweltering seashore? After all, ask yourself, how many people put on a fur coat to go to the beach? <laughs> Unless, of course, they live in Scotland. <laughs> Yet two of the prototypes for these beaches are at Macarese and Frigeni outside Rome. The dogs are provided with umbrellas, this is true, showers, and meals in restaurants. <laughs> the despair I feel about all of this has nothing to do with disliking dogs. It's the dog owners I'm worried about. I've been a dog lover all my life. I had no choice. My father had dogs. If that makes it sound like a disease, that's probably fair enough. I don't ever remember him actually buying a dog. It just seemed that every so often, he developed a dog. <laughs> I remember he and my mother came home at half past 10 one night from the pictures with a smooth-haired fox terrier. It had followed them when they got off the bus, my father said. I believe him. He had an uncanny rapport with animals of all kinds. Dogs did sometimes follow him home. Jackie was one. Jackie followed him home and stayed the night. It was returned to its owners and then came back to our house the same night. This happened so often that the owners told my father to keep it, since it had obviously decided where it wanted to live. That was Jackie. You didn't decide Jackie was your dog. Jackie decided you were his human. Jackie was a brown and white mongrel with a coat so rough and ill-fitting he looked as if he had borrowed it from a bigger dog and hadn't had the alterations done yet. He would be lucky if he stood a foot high, but nobody had told him that. 
He thought Alsatians were a pushover. In case that gives you the wrong impression, Jackie was also the most intelligent dog I have ever come across. I kid you not. This was Wittgenstein with a tail. Small example. Jackie used to travel everywhere on the bus by himself. He simply jumped aboard and lay in the space under the stairs he used to have in the old buses and got off at his own stop. A neighbor who saw Jackie in the bus once heard a passenger inform the conductress that there was an unaccompanied dog on the bus. Aye, the conductress said, that dog always gets this bus. <laughs> Never been known to pay a fare yet either. <laughs> When Jackie went shopping with my mother one day, and she joined the queue for the bus that went in the direction of my grandmother's house, Jackie waited in the adjoining queue for the bus that passed our street. <laughs> my mother said he kept trotting down to her queue to stare at her quizzically, as if trying to, to suggest gently that she had lost her marbles. <laughs> the bus for our house came first and Jackie got on it, standing briefly on the platform as it pulled away and staring back before returning to his reserved seat under the stairs. My mother couldn't swear to it, but she thought he might have been shaking his head at her. <laughs> Badly wounded in a dog fight, Jackie lay in his blanket without anesthetic and let my father stitch him together with very fine fuse wire. Not a sound. He healed well. When he reached an agonized old age and my father finally took him to the vet, Jackie lay watching my father with what looked like affection till the last sleep came. I suspect my father whimpered a bit, but Jackie didn't. He was a philosopher to the end. Jackie loved my father, and my father treated him like a dog. That was the point, to treat a dog as if it is just a funny-shaped person with a very severe speech impediment <laughs> is a kind of decadent colonialism like trying to convert a happy native from his natural life to the dubious joys of civilized neurosis. Jackie may have had a kind of genius, but it was a genius he could only express in his own ways, which included shoving his nose up very unsavory places and leaving little messages in urine all over the place and fighting other dogs and going on the hunt for very small bitches. It was what he did. He was a dog. So if we ever feel like getting a psychiatrist for our dogs, maybe we should get one for ourselves first. It should at least help us to realize that our need may be greater than theirs, that it may be our sense of us which is the problem, not the dog's sense of itself. Remember Jackie, I know I will. <laughs>